Now we focus on that new wave of imperialism I was talking about that starts uh, primarily in the early 1980s, or 1980s, 1880s. Um, and let's first talk about why we have this new shift. So obviously Britain was a little bit ahead of the game, to a lesser extent, France and maybe even Russia a little bit, but it's not really going to begin until the 1880s. Uh, and now there's a couple reasons why. First of all, Germany exists now. Uh, and, and Germany's going to be a big driving force here uh, because Germany especially is going to uh, lead or instigate a renewed uh, sense or drive, uh, yeah, a renewed sense uh, for competition uh, driven by nationalism, maybe even hyper-nationalism, but certainly by nationalism. Um, so, just briefly, the British aren't nearly as uh, motivated by nationalism. F first of all, England itself is one small state. Well, it's one of the multiple states of the United Kingdom, uh, which is run together as one country, so they don't really have much of a British ethnic identity, you could argue English certainly, and, and their culture coming from England predominantly, but uh, they were a bit more open to uh, including others, not so, more, so much seeing themselves as superior, but maybe perhaps their system or culture, but not like racially superior or their nation. Uh, Germany's a little different, so they were much more, the British were much more enlightened and pragmatic in their approach. Uh, it was more about enhancing their commerce, and even spreading what they saw as civility, uh, w w which sort of has its own uh, condescending, even social Darwinist tones. But the social Darwinism and the extreme racism, certainly, is more limited to uh, the drives. And again, I'm not characterizing all Germans as, as racist or hyper-nationalistic, certainly not. Uh, but um, it was much more common due to the ethos or, or, or zeitgeist spirit of the times in Germany, uh, and they're more embracing of the counter-enlightenment, romantic, nationalist, idealist uh, uh, perspectives, as opposed to the more pragmatic, enlightenment-influenced uh, approaches and systems of the British. Now, imperialism itself is not enlightenment, uh, so you can certainly separate those two from your mind. Enlightenment, again, is, is more about free trade and cosmopolitanism and cooperation, not conquest. Uh, so imperialism itself, even the British, of course, uh, would be a more of a nationalistic counter-enlightenment movement. Um, so the, the British definitely were flirting with both, but uh, the Germans focused a lot more on the counter-enlightenment uh, driving forces of romanticism and nationalism uh, and even genetic superiority, uh, which we mentioned in previous lectures when we're talking about social Darwinism, how... Um, they misinterpreted their success uh, and attributing it, attributed it to uh, racial or genetic superiority when really it was, well, first of all, chance. They just, the English happened to come up with these systems and protections that worked and spread to the rest of Europe uh, and the competitive status they had there. But there's a reason why the uh, civilizations of the Middle East, even North Africa, and certainly Europe, East Asia, and South Asia uh, were further ahead than the rest of the world. It wasn't because of their superior race. It was just because of their geography. Uh, they were interconnected. So any good idea or advancement that was uh, found in one state, whether it's the Chinese, the Indians, the Europeans, or, or whoever it was in this network, uh, it spread relatively quickly, either via trade routes or via conquest, because uh, the uh, steppe lands and waterways of this region and the climate, which was relatively similar, because it's an east-west orientation, so the temperature and climate uh, of one region is relatively similar to the, temp rel uh, the climate of... of um, of an eastern or, or western counterpart, there was way more connectivity. There's more trade, engagement, and cultural connections. So again, any ideas were, were, were spread and copied or adopted or improved uh, in this network here. Uh, and again, it just so happens that the Europeans, based on their position in the world, uh, relating to the Americas and the systems that came out of England, just happened to uh, uh, be ahead of the curve a bit. But uh, all of these civilizations were ahead of the rest of the world whether they're Southeast Asia, the Indian Archipelago, uh, the, the, uh, the peoples of the Pacific Islands and Australia, New Zealand, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Americas, uh, they weren't pine because they were inferior people. Their culture just didn't have uh, as many uh, networks of connection. So that's why these areas were more resistant to disease because they were more passed along and also more uh, 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 pandemics and deaths due to those pandemics. But also those ideas got to spread and advance their cultures and uh, systems far beyond the others. So um, 
the Germans and, and not just the Germans, Europeans that adopted social uh, Darwinist views, whether they were in Great Britain or France or wherever they were, uh, falsely, incorrectly attributed that to genetic superiority when it really was just a, a, a benefit of being connected to so many cultures for so long and just happening to come up with certain ideas just by chance first uh, and spreading them. And like we know now, anytime you spread uh, economic stability, education, uh, and, and um, Western economic political practices elsewhere, uh, even sometimes without the political practices, uh, you have um, other uh, cultures that adopt them uh, voluntarily, or maybe even not voluntarily, but certainly voluntarily, um, catch up very quickly, like we've seen in South Korea, in China recently, in Japan, um, in many other Eastern and Southeast Asian uh, territories, India increasingly, um, some of the economies in uh, Africa having got rid of the, uh, having stabilized their states and got rid of uh, impractical socialist practices and pressures from the United States or Soviet Union, uh, they're also uh, quickly um, uh, modernizing and catching up uh, with these systems. So anyone can do it. It's just Europe happened to, happened to get there first out of this network of Eurasian uh, civilizations that were interconnected. Anyways, so there's this renewed sense of competition. Um, and most of it, not all of it, the French definitely take part in it, as do the other European states, and so do the, the, the British trying to expand and protect their empires, and the Russians as well. Uh, but the Germans especially drove this, this home. Uh, so the, um, uh, the emergence of Germany, uh, Germany as a state, uh, and one that's driven by, uh, by romantic nationalism, and idealism, uh, counter-enlightenment ideals, are gonna be a, a major driving force. So, new imperialism uh, causes, I would say, uh, are one, the renewed competition. Again, Germany's gonna drive a lot of that. Uh, and secondly, a, um, a decline, or I didn't say decline, a return to, to uh, protectionism. Uh, so declining free trade, and that begins first with Germany, 1879, that, that tariff agreement, uh, and then in 1881, the French also are going to abandon their uh, free trade practices with the British and others. So now countries begin to, uh, due to uh, the series of panics like the Panic of, eight, of eight, 1873 that was like an almost 10-year recession, and uh, and other panics previously, which people blamed on free trade and other countries screwing up and not affecting their economies, they became much more protectionist. So now this kind of goes back to semi-mercantilism where the objective is obtain as many resources uh, uh, and as much wealth as possible uh, at the expense of others and you want to beat your rivals there and or take stuff from them. Uh, and that's what's going to instigate this new wave. And again, the defining feature here is it's not the Americas anymore. The U.S. has sort of said no to Europeans going over there. Although how well they could have stopped them and enforced that is uh, certainly in the uh, mid to late 19th century questionable. Uh, nonetheless, it was, was laid down. Spain had been largely uh, removed from, uh, in Portugal too, from uh, the Americas. So the focus now is Europeans uh, taking over Africa, which we'll talk about first, uh, and then continuing to uh, um, colonize the rest of um, of Africa, Eurasia that, that hadn't been um, claimed at that point. So that's going to be the rush here. <clears throat> and those, that's largely the reasons for those two. So um, we'll begin with um, this, uh, what's called the scramble for Africa. All right, this is a period from, uh, <clears throat> you could say, went all the way from the 1880s. Uh, till uh, it continued all the way up until the 1930s, honestly, with, with Italy at least. Um, so, with decreasing intensity, <clears throat> well, we'll say till 1914, because by 1914, almost all of Africa was, was claimed or administered imperially by, by European powers. Uh, but do know that, that Italy's going to try to make their mark in, in, in Libya and Ethiopia in the 1930s, too. <clears throat> so, Scramble for Africa is basically where. Um, the countries of Great Britain, France, Germany, these are the three primary ones that are going to compete for uh, uh, land grabs. I should also note, uh, and we'll also note that already present are Portugal, 
Spain is going to get involved here on the coast of, of, of uh, what is now like Morocco. So to a lesser extent, Portugal, Spain, uh, and uh, Belgium are going to be involved in this as well. But here are your main belligerents here, Great Britain, France, and Germany. Uh, so we saw the seeds of it already in North Africa, with the Ottoman Empire uh, slowly um, decaying. Um, we'll focus on Morocco here at the end here in 1905-1911, but we'll, we'll talk first about Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and that conquest. So the reason why it's possible, um, well, number one, you have these two driving forces, but it's possible because of the technology, because if you remember from earlier, um, they have now uh, cuning, so Europeans can survive the uh, tropical disease like malaria. Uh, you have technologies like um, uh, breech-loading rifles, uh, machine guns, which are far uh, quicker, more accurate, powerful, and uh, 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 can fire more rapidly. Um, give a massive advantage to European forces in Africa, which largely lacked the ability to use gunpowder at all, um, or was severely limited, uh, and certainly um, uh, did not have these updated versions of, uh, of these weapons unless they purchased them from uh, Europeans themselves. Uh, but they also had uh, steel ships and steam ships, steel slash steam ships, uh, to uh, carry transport, uh, use gunboats, and go up these rivers to the interior. So now it's possible technologically, uh, and they also have sufficient motivations themselves. So it's a little bit disorganized initially. Um, so pretty quickly, we have... Uh, I'll give some general um, uh, references here. You have uh, the Germans, Belgians, and French all uh, competing for control of this uh, Congo uh, River, what was known as the uh, Kingdom of the Congo. It wasn't really an organized uh, kingdom per se. Uh, and they, um, Angola was already largely under control uh, of the Portuguese. Uh, now going to the interior more. But the Congo uh, didn't really have any means to, of course, uh, resist these, these new technologies uh, coming in from the Europeans. So um, you're going to have a, a joint conflict between uh, Germany, um, Belgium to a lesser extent, and uh, France for this Congo region. And the uh, main focus is going to be the competition between uh, Germany and Britain in claiming uh, the eastern portions of Africa. Um, competition between Germany and France in Central Africa, and then competition between uh, Britain and France here in West Africa. Um, so, because there's kind of this quick rush out there, there's no clearly defined borders as to who owns what uh, regarding the um, uh, Europeans. Uh, of course, they were not really particularly interested in uh, the already existing states that existed, um, whether they were sultanates or, or, or more Christianized kingdoms, but most of them were sultanates at this point. Um, or majority Muslim because of their connection with the Arabs from the past. Uh, you had some Asante kingdoms, some Hausa kingdoms, some Congo kingdoms, and some sultanates uh, throughout uh, Western, Central, and uh, uh, West, Northwestern Africa. But again, they, they didn't really have the capacity to resist these um, uh, European invaders due to their technologies. Uh, so some are going to join uh, forces with the um, uh, uh, British or the French, depending on their particular alignment. Uh, uh, that's where a lot of this is going to be going on, but, but just know that these Asante Hausa uh, kingdoms, the uh, um, um, sultanates that exist in this area and, and the Congo kingdoms are, are going to exist, but they're, they're going to be, um, while they had been associated with the slave trade since the, thousand, the 11th century, the Arabs, they're going to be um, uh, largely ne neglected here because uh, they just don't have the um, technology to, to resist. And again, the Europeans are, 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 are preying on these internal conflicts that are already going on here, and had been going on for centuries, uh, they're going to uh, take advantage of that as well. So that's what the uh, uh, competition is going to be. So initially, though, it, it's kind of a chaotic scramble, chaotic, disorganized scramble uh, for uh, territory. So we have competition. British and Germans in the east, uh, Germans, French, and the Belgians, but mostly Germans and the French here in the central, uh, and then Western, it's uh, the British and French, all competing for territory. It's not clear who owns what. There's no uh, actual boundaries. Boundaries they do make, of course, don't really pay attention to the ethnic conflicts that are already present in Africa, so you end up lumping some uh, rival or enemy African tribes and groups together, and that's going to be a problem later on down the road uh, with, uh, with uh, post-World War II genocides and civil wars, but uh, nonetheless, uh, that's going to be going on. Uh, and uh, another thing you notice, too, is they're 
Not that these guys are humane uh, captains of progress, but keep in mind, especially with the English, um, there is still a degree of Enlightenment influence that um, does believe at least somewhat in, in some form of human rights or natural rights. So Europeans at this point by the 1880s do condemn slavery, um, uh, especially the British who had done it earlier on in the century. Um, so they, they do notice a lot of uh, inhumane practices and slavery that are still taking place in Africa, uh, as they had been in, the rest of, in Africa and the rest of the world for, for, for since ever, for the most part, as far as humans go. Um, they're going to uh, um, realize slavery and um, um, uh, poor conditions of Africa. So this is, this is a problem for many Europeans. Again, it's hard to navigate who controls what, um, uh, administer that peacefully. The competitions are difficult to, uh, to manage. You have internal conflicts among African kingdoms that are also confusing. They're also just even trying to just still chart what, what this looks like on the interior, because this is the first time they're really able to go beyond the coasts. Uh, and then they're also uh, um, trying to, oh, I forgot to mention that, they're also trying to uh, uh, do Christian missionary work too. Uh, so these three things are all kind of going on. Oh, and again, they are unhappy with the uh, inhumane conditions and slavery, although uh, the Belgians and, uh, to a lesser extent, the Germans aren't going to be uh, uh, the best enforcers of these uh, uh, abolitionist uh, endeavors. So those are the, the three things they realize. So uh, to sort of organize this or, yeah, form some sort of common protocol that makes this a bit more organized and peaceful among the Europeans and, and sort of tries to come together to end some of these uh, more inhumane practices like slavery. Uh, Otto Bismarck of Germany um, is going to organize a, uh, a conference where the Europeans are going to settle down essentially uh, and decide how to um, establish a, a common precedent here in Africa. Now they don't really have the means to enforce it, but they, they do agree to a lot of these terms. And again, some do ignore them uh, or exploit them but uh, largely they wanted to agree on several things. So number one, they wanted to uh, organize uh, the uh, colonization of Africa uh, by Europeans. They also wanted to uh, um, ban slavery on the continent because they'd already ba banned it in their own empires and their own former colonies and other parts of the world, but then they realized that when they got there, the, the slave trade was, was, had been going on there since way before the Portuguese got there and was still going on in Africa and with the Arabs and, and in the rest of the world. So they wanted to end that, and they also wanted to uh, promote uh, Christian missionary work. Uh, the conference itself is referred to as the Berlin Conference, as it was uh, called for and hosted by um, um, Germany's Ottawa Bismarck Conference. And that's going to be in 1885. And that's what their goal is going to be here, is to achieve these uh, two or three goals of missionary work, banning slavery, and organizing the, the colonization. Um, and one of the uh, lead proponents here is uh, a, a notorious and infamous gentleman by the name of Leopold uh, II of uh, Belgium is going to uh, be a strong advocate of this um, approach, especially the uh, making it more humane and banning slavery. Uh, and in fact, uh, what they're going to do is they're going to actually reward him with uh, a personal private colony uh, of the Belgian Congo. That is going to uh, form itself here, Belgian Congo. And uh, they're going to divvy up this land um, much more in a much more organized fashion. So here we go. Portugal, Germany. Um, we also have Germany up here. Uh, Great Britain up here. Uh, France is going to have a huge chunk. Here, and the British are going to get sub several slivers over in there. Or is Germany up here? No, Germany was up here. Okay, so it's going to look something like this. I mean, my my map's definitely not perfect, but all right. So red, I got France, so you can kind of kind of see it. France. 
they're going to pretty much control most of northwestern Africa. Uh, and again, they're, uh, while beforehand they, they were con in conflict, uh, in competition with the British here in West Africa, trying to um, exploit or, or use African kingdoms, uh, supporting certain ones that support the French or the British, I guess one of their, that's going to largely uh, calm down uh, or, or end here. And the British are going to uh, gain control of some of the coastal regions, like what is now Ghana and, and, and Nigeria and places like that. Um, but the French are going to largely control this West Africa portion. Germany's going to get uh, tidbits throughout, so he's green for them. In East Africa, uh, in South West Africa, in Central Africa, in the Congo. Uh, and of course, you already have the uh, Portuguese that were previously there. Uh, and, and the rest is going to be claimed later, but initially that's kind of what it looks like. And then later on, this interior portion is going to be consolidated as well. Uh, the only one that kind of escapes that is going to be Ethiopia here in their highland position that no one really attempts to go to later to the Italians do, um, at least to conquer it, and uh, the Italians fail to do so. So good job, Ethiopians, uh, for that. Belgium will do black because they uh, are the uh, bad guys here. At least Leopold is, not Belgians themselves. All right, so very quickly, uh, Africa is, is going to be carved up and colonized uh, by the... Um, uh, European. So I actually want to rewrite this Leopold thing here. That's going to make it look like he organized it. Uh, because Audubon Bismarck of Germany organized it. But what I want to take away from this, though, is uh, Leopold II of Belgium uh, promised to, of course, uh, make this Congo uh, colony of his a, a, a humanitarian, I don't want to say paradise, but uh, a humanitarian uh, reduce the amount of slavery and inhumane practices. Um, I am going to extend what the British later do control, though, uh, to what they actually control later, which is going to be this region here for the most part. Minus Libya, which is going to be taken later, uh, and then Somalia, too, later. But those are a bit later. All right. So that's about what we get there. Uh, Morocco's going to be a bit later as well. Oh, Spain actually took this check here. So, well, that's Spain. Um, anyways, so it largely looks like that um, by the uh, 1890s, certainly by World War I, uh, that's roughly what it looks like. Uh, Leopold I, second of Belgium, um, he gets the notorious, uh, infamous legacy of his uh, total lie uh, to the Berlin Conference. Uh, he actually hid what was going on in the Congo, Belgium for a long time. Uh, he just used it for personal gain. Uh, he would. He was a particularly savage uh, uh, ruler, and not to the Belgians, uh, but to the uh, uh, savage ruler. Uh, let me just put this: savage treatment of uh, African natives. Uh, there are some wild estimate ranges from five to twenty million. Uh, no, actually, one to twenty million. So, take with a grain of salt. Regardless, even the low estimates they'll put it at least a million. Uh, so, at least seven digits, possibly into the uh, 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 eight digits. We're gonna have African casualties across this uh, twenty-three year span, I think, uh, because the Belgian Congo is gonna be his private colony. Uh, from 1885 uh, to 1908. And again, he's going to use that uh, to fund, to benefit uh, financially himself. So not the people of Belgium in particular. So he's going to have some savage treatment. It's going to be basically slave conditions. Uh, he's going to overwork them and undernourish them. So there's a lot of deaths from disease and um, uh, worker accidents um, and uh, just starvation. But also, he's going to have some severe punishments like... Um, for example, uh, one of the things that he was extracting were, uh, was ivory, first of all, but uh, then rubber um, became um, a major export, as, long as, as well as palm oil there in Western and Central Africa. Um, so to extract as much wealth as he could from the ivory and uh, rubber of the region, uh, he would actually punish if uh, Native Africans didn't meet their rubber quota. Uh, whether it was man, woman, or child, he would uh, remove their hand uh, for it, or their limb, certainly their hand. Uh, removal of limb for failure to meet quota. And it wasn't until 1904 that, that Europeans started realizing what was going on there. Uh, as soon as they did, uh, they all condemned what the um, 
Belgians were doing, and the gov Belgian government itself actually uh, confiscated it from Leopold as his private colony, but he'd already amassed you know, untold amounts of wealth from it. Uh, and also, to make it even more complex, he had done a ton of spending in Belgium for, for public buildings that they were all using this sort of blood money uh, for, as well as private buildings, which he then donated to Belgium uh, later. Uh, so it, would, it put Belgium in, in an awkward spot as, as far as what to do with these, um, these uh, uh, buildings and, and projects. But uh, So in 1908, the uh, Belgian government is going to confiscate it. And so far as I know, <clears throat> they're going to uh, administer the Belgian Congo far more humanely than, uh, than uh, Leopold II's absurdly inhumane and um, detestable uh, practices. Um, the Belgians weren't the only ones guilty of this, though. Like I said before, the French and especially the British were a bit <clears throat> less genocidal uh, and, and racist, not the French as much as the British, but uh, the Germans had a couple instances in which they were uh, particularly malicious uh, in their treatment of uh, native Africans. Uh, in East Africa, as well as here in um, uh, Southwest Africa, from 1904, 1904 to 1907, uh, you had several um, instances where Local resistance or issues or opposition to German rule occurred, and the Germans just absolutely curb stomped the resistance, like far beyond what they needed to, uh, to the point that uh, the natives consider it genocide. And I think, I think, in fact, recently, the German government has uh, acknowledged that it was uh, technically a genocide and apologized for it. But from 1904 to 1907, you had several, uh, and we're not talking scale of Holocaust here. I mean, that's, again, the Germans, and later in World War II. Uh, but you do have some uh, African native genocide uh, in response to uh, resistance. So another important thing to know here is that uh, all of these areas attempted to resist imperialism, but I mean, they just didn't have the economic, technological, um, uh, or organizational uh, ability at the time to do that. Um, now, so nowadays it's a bit more different, obviously. Uh, a lot of the world is catching up or has caught up uh, to the West, but uh, back then certainly there was no ability uh, or organization that, that could do that uh, at the time. Um, so um, we do have instances of resistance, it's just, it's relatively futile uh, up until uh, World War II, just because people, uh, other civilizations lacked the uh, ability to do it, whether it was um, technology or, or, or just social organization. So you have resistance throughout India, uh, you individually on those local kingdom levels, uh, as well as uh, an attempted rebellion in 1857. It doesn't work. Uh, you have uh, China resisting in the first, second opium wars, uh, and again in, a, in the Box Rebellion, which we'll get to here shortly. Uh, you have the, uh, what else, what other examples do we have? Oh, the Zulu kingdoms resisting, probably the best African resistance there was as far as uh, unity. Uh, you have multiple instances of, exist of resistance by the House of Santi uh, kingdoms here in Western, uh, Western Africa, uh, the Congo kingdoms, the Sultanates throughout, it's just they didn't really have the capacity to do it. So don't think that people didn't resist and there weren't efforts to do it, it's just it was, they were just unsuccessful, uh, unfortunately. In fact, the most successful ones were actually nonviolent, uh, coming from the International Congress and, and uh, not the civil disobedience practices of Gandhi uh, in the 1920s, 30s, and, and 40s. All right, so that is a, a basic summary of the scramble for Africa. Uh, and again, while, they, while most do generally attempt to try to improve the conditions, they are definitely still economically and politically exploiting uh, these uh, regions. They often drew borders that were ignorant of uh, local ethnic differences and rivalries. So you, as soon as the Europeans left, there was just the outbreak of mass civil war in, in a lot of these places and genocide. Uh, whether it was Rwanda or whether it was in Nigeria uh, with the Biafran people. Uh, there's lots of examples of it. Um, uh, and, and that's, of course, a, um, a long-standing problem. Uh, nonetheless, that's basically what the scramble for Africa is, and that's, that's essentially how it was um, uh, established. And even though they did have humanitarian, uh, humanitarian goals, uh, there are definitely some uh, poignant examples of that not being carried out with the... Uh, um, uh, Leopold II uh, in the Belgian Congo, and then the couple instances of um, uh, brutal uh, reprisal 
for resistance uh, by the Germans in East Africa and uh, Southwestern Africa. But yeah, that is the scramble for Africa. And next we will move on to um, China and uh, Southeast Asia. Final segment is gonna be on China. Um, we've already established the opium wars uh, and how they've allowed the French and British to uh, uh, control several uh, territories and ports uh, in Southern and Central China. Uh, they've allowed extraterritoriality so that the, uh, certainly the British uh, and, and French uh, Europeans could, could come in and, and go wherever they wanted on the coast and interior of China. Uh, and they had that uh, diplomatic immunity where uh, the Chinese couldn't hold them uh, accountable for Chinese laws or customs. They had to be tried for crimes uh, by their own government or their own diplomats and officials. So you had residents uh, and factories and ports and um, these uh, Europeans that essentially didn't have to abide by Chinese laws and customs uh, going throughout China, which upset uh, many uh, and, and largely threatened Chinese sovereignty. In fact, you could argue at this point they didn't even have it because um, they couldn't even punish people on their own soil for, for breaking their own laws. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, at least regarding the rebellion that's going to happen, is uh, the spread of Christianity uh, throughout uh, China through the uh, missionary work, uh, which is going to anger uh, some of the uh, old school traditional uh, Chinese uh, and Confucius, whether they were uh, Manchurian uh, Qing uh, descendants or, or Han Chinese uh, in central China. Before we get there, though, um, the Europeans sort of realized that the gate was open on China once they'd lost the first Sino-Japanese War uh, to the Japanese in 1895. So uh, after 1895, well, there was that brief period in the 1880s where Europeans were a bit more hesitant to, to, uh, to go after China because they were focused on uh, settling in Africa. Uh, the Russians had backed off of China um, uh, due to their, they hesitated because of the advancements Chinese had made to their militaries. Uh, and also too, uh, the, the French had lost a, a, a land conflict uh, to the Chinese on a couple occasions. Again, navally, they, they, they did not um, stand a chance, but on, on the ground, they defeated the French, uh, they'd scared the Russians, so people were a little intimidated, but when Japan came in 1895 and cleared the clean house, the world realized, wow, China is much more vulnerable than, than we previously anticipated. And also, uh, the Africa uh, issue was, was largely settling, so Europeans could focus a lot more on, on China, since India was pretty much uh, completed, uh, Russia had pretty much claimed most of Central Asia and the Caucasus region. Um, the Ottoman Empire was just holding on by a thread there in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, Persia is going to largely come under the influence of the British at this point. Uh, the Dutch East Indies uh, is under control of the, uh, the Dutch. The British are settling Australia. Uh, and the French also in the 1880s are going to start and complete uh, later their conquest of what is uh, referred to as French Indochina. Of course, not Thailand, though, that's what is now Siam. Uh, but Burma and the other places are going to be uh, controlled by the British. The French get Southeast Asia. The Dutch have uh, Indonesia here. Um, the Dutch is just going to be, we'll make them black with some of colors here. Uh, the Dutch and the Dutch East Indies. And the British are going to settle uh, and colonize Australia uh, along the coast. Most of this is uninhabitable outback region. Um, and then New Zealand as well with the Maori people. And then we're going to have the, the British and, and French and later uh, Americans um, in the Philippines and the uh, Pacific Islands uh, and in the U.S. and Hawaii, too, at this point. So in 1898, we're going to have the U.S. and the Philippines after the Spanish-American War. We're focusing on China. So uh, this is kind of the last-ish area. In, Japan has shown, uh, certainly by 1905, that they're not going to be uh, imperialized. They're an imperial power by themselves, and, and we're winding down. So China's one of the last focuses. Um, Russia is going to uh, first exploit them by uh, gaining access to and control of uh, this northern China region, uh, along with now Mongol uh, Mongolia and Manchuria, which is eventually where they're going to uh, have a conflict over the railroads uh, in this warm water um, uh, bay between Japan and Russia. But for now, uh, they're exercising control there. The Japanese have, of course, control of Taiwan. Um, parts of uh, central China and, and uh, Korea, and a little bit of territory on the inner peninsulas here. So China is uh, large under their uh, foreign control, and by the 1890s, we also have the Germans have made an entrance, uh, and they are primarily uh, active uh, near what is now in central and northern China, Shanghai, and the uh, Yellow River Valley. Um, 
it wasn't quite as extensive as the British. I probably shouldn't draw that much, but uh, they do have um, a lot of influence here on the interior. So uh, 1895, again, uh, the weakness is shown, and by the late 1890s, late 1890s, a combination of Russia, Britain, France, and uh, Japan, am I forgetting one? Oh, Germany, uh, are going to, uh, um, uh, how can I phrase this, uh, maintain uh, influence over uh, most of China. So they're, they're actually definitely under threat of uh, territorial uh, division and uh, just outright control by, by foreign powers. So there's one issue that, that occurs. This is actually, I forgot to mention, this, this is a large uh, motivation for the settlement of Africa. Um, the, the Berlin Conference being called in 1885, as well as in the 1890s, a call by the US who had no access to China like the uh, other Europeans and Japanese did, uh, they were opting for a, an open door policy, which meant uh, there's no spheres of influence um, so they, they wanted no spheres of influence, which again is a uh, basically exclusive trading rights uh, with whatever uh, European powers in control, whether it's France and southern China, uh, the British in central China, uh, around the Yangtze River Valley, and the, the, the Germans in northern China around the Yellow River, and the Russians in Manchuria, or the, or the Japanese along the uh, coast in, in Korea and Taiwan. Uh, they did not want uh, uh, spheres of influence uh, as far as, you know, monopolistic uh, access to the markets. The U.S. wanted to be able to sell things in China as well. And that was part of the reason why they had the Berlin Conference uh, in 1885 uh, started by Germany. So it wasn't unheard of, uh, but uh, while they aren't going to largely agree to it, most of them are, they're not going to adhere to it. And one of the reasons why is there's going to be a big distraction in starting in 1899, which is referred to as the Boxer Rebellion. That's the Western name for it. They were martial artists. Um, but these are basically uh, traditional... Uh, Chinese nationalists who uh, detested this foreign influence and their main focus of fury uh, was the Germans who were a bit uh, more, how can I phrase this, condescending or imperial than the uh, other, uh, except for maybe the Japanese, than the British, um, certainly the British and the Russians, um, uh, and maybe not that much more the Japanese and the French, but they were the most uh, belligerent uh, as far as their, their control over the Chinese. So they were a uh, 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 this is a mostly non-governmental rebellion, uh, and it took mostly mostly took place here in this northern central region uh, from 1899 up till about roughly 1901. Maybe a bit later, you could you could argue some some conflicts are to continue, but it's largely settled by uh, 1901. Uh, so here we have the Boxer Rebellion. Wait, no, China is I'm doing China. Red. Boxer Rebellion. And this actually largely started, of course they're opposed to, to foreign influence, and especially the ones that are particularly imperialistic, like the Germans uh, in, in China. They're going to, uh, it's going to largely going to be start as a, a resistance to, and uh, um, actually the slaying of European Christian uh, missionaries. So that's how this whole thing actually starts, is on the countryside they begin uh, uh, persecuting, targeting, and killing um, uh, European missionaries, Christian missionaries, and of course, according to many of the treaties uh, established, that was disallowed. Uh, they couldn't go after Europeans. Uh, and again, this wasn't the government. In fact, the Qing government itself did not condone the boxers doing this. Initially, the, uh, the Qing government uh, opposed the uh, rebellion. Qing government initially opposed uh, the rebellion. And in fact, they actually tried to help a lot of the uh, um, uh, Europeans in the region uh, escape uh, these boxers. Um, but some false reports get out that the Qing government uh, was not helping uh, these Europeans out, and that the boxers were killing more than they actually were. They were definitely still killing people, and they actually did too kill a couple of German ambassadors, uh, which Germany was uh, particularly upset about. Um, but, um, the Qing, while they do initially oppose the boxers, they actually end up supporting the boxers because they realize as this movement grows that let's say if the boxers end up winning, or even if they lose actually, 
if the Qing doesn't help them out, then they've totally lost the support of the people of China, who already are unhappy with uh, how they've sort of let the Europeans and Japanese sort of carve up their territory. Um, so they initially oppose it, uh, but um, support and actually join the rebellion uh, by 1901. Um, initially, they are going to have some uh, success because the Europeans aren't ready for this. So with the boxers and later Qing government that joined them, they, they do chase out a lot of the European uh, settlers, missionaries, and forces. But uh, um, a, a massive international coalition uh, including Americans and all the countries listed here, uh, are going to uh, um, have no opposition navally from the Chinese, uh, and they're going to invade and put down this rebellion brutally, particularly the Germans, who were uh, very upset about the uh, killing of their ambassadors uh, and officials over there. So a, a multi-nation coalition is going to end uh, the rebellion. And then you're going to see the last phase of the Qing Dynasty, because 19, by 1911, the, the upset population of China is going to outright uh, reject and uh, overthrow the Qing uh, government. Uh, and they're going to be reinstalled as a puppet government in 1931 by the Japanese in Manchuria when they invade, but that's, that's the end of dynastic rule in China in 1911 when they shift to a re republic and then basically engage in a local uh, warlord, ruler, conflict, civil war thing uh, to World War II. Uh, or the second sign of Japanese when the Japanese invade in uh, 1937. And then after World War II, they're going to have a civil war uh, where they uh, fight uh, between the nationalist forces backed by capitalist uh, democracies and then the uh, communists backed by the Soviet Union. And the communists end up being victorious, but that's Chinese history. We won't worry about that. Uh, what I do want you to know, though, is that uh, this Boxer Rebellion uh, popped up in opposition to the foreign presence, the uh, weak Qing government, uh, and the Christian missionaries. Uh, it does spread and is initially successful, but the uh, European coalition uh, is going to uh, uh, come back. I think the first time when they sent their initial force, it wasn't quite large enough, and they were uh, less successful than they planned to be, uh, losing a couple of engagements, or at least not being able to win. Uh, they come back, though, a second time with a more robust, serious force and, and, and put down the rebellion. Uh, and then China, again, is going to be pretty much a state of chaos and exploitation until uh, the Chinese Communist Party is victorious in uh, 1949 and they sort of consolidate their control of China. Uh, and then, of course, end up killing far more millions of people than uh, any foreigners did uh, with Mao's reforms. Uh, but by the 1980s, they, they reverse it and make some free market uh, reforms and are uh, doing really well now, at least economically. So that is uh, imperialism in China. And uh, that's it for new imperialism. Uh, one thing I do have to mention in, in this part of the curriculum is the impact this has. So it has, it has two primary impacts that I want to mention here, and that is this. Uh, imperialism itself, and, and this competition, this nationalistic competition, uh, is going to be a, a, a major contributor uh, to uh, what's going to be later World War I. So uh, imperialism itself, imperialism, uh, is a major contributor. Uh, to World War I, uh, just because of the nationalistic uh, competition. Particularly Germany. Uh, and there's a good case to be made for it. They weren't correct in completely blaming Germany for World War I and having the Versailles Treaty and uh, you know, engaging that whole crisis and, and punishing Germany uh, much more than anyone else when they, when they lose World War I. But uh, the Germans definitely do contribute to this heightened uh, competition uh, and um, um, What's the word for? Animosity between European powers. And there's a pretty good case to be made here. So the first thing they do um, is when they form as a nation, their, their sort of de facto enemy is, is France, back from the uh, Napoleonic era and, and the Franco-Prussian War going forward. So they immediately begin to start forming these alliances with other European powers uh, to sort of alienate France and protect Germany against French uh, uh, revenge attempts. So. First, they form an alliance with Austria-Hungary, their neighbor, and also enemy of France, uh, as well as Russia uh, in 1873, I think. It's pretty close to when they formed in 1871. Uh, that was known as the uh, Three Emperors League. And again, that was uh, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Russia. 
That doesn't last that long, though, because Russia and Austria-Hungary are going to disagree on um, um, the Polish uh, and their territorial uh, Slavic regions as far as their borders. So that, that is not going to last all that long. Russia's going to drop out pretty quickly, again, due to the uh, disagreement between Austria-Hungary and Russia. Germany's going to favor the Austria-Hungarian uh, Empire because it is largely administered by, by Germans, uh, and that's going to be important to Germany, which I'll get to in, in a minute. Um, so that's against France, and France isn't going to take that uh, uh, very well. Uh, and in 1883 or 82, 84 maybe? Hold on. I think I wrote the year down because I always forget the exact year. I did not. I think it's 1882, though. 1882, uh, you have the Triple Alliance, which has the same objective, to alienate France and protect Germany. So Germany has its uh, same ally in Austria-Hungary, but they're going to add Italy, uh, who is also... Uh, a sort of rival with um, France. But they also hate Austria-Hungary, so it's not going to be a very good alliance. In fact, when World War II begins, uh, Italy's going to switch sides to go after Austria-Hungary uh, pretty quickly. Nonetheless, what this does, though, is it greatly angers France, obviously, because they're the, the direct target of this alienation attempt, and they're less protected. And it also makes Britain a bit more skeptical of Germany. They start shifting their concern from uh, Russia as they sort of start consolidating their empire and realizing Russia's not a threat. They shift their focus on alienating Russia and, and consider them their main rival and focus on Germany, who is really belligerent right out the gate, especially uh, uh, when the scramble for Africa uh, begins. So they start shifting their focus to Germany as the biggest threat the British do. And by 1907, since the French already hate the um, uh, British, sorry, since the French already hate the uh, Germans, and the British are increasingly concerned about how aggressive uh, uh, the Germans are, in, as far as instigating military alliances uh, in spreading uh, their empire around the world um, and with industrializing, and not just you know to make their country better, but to, to make their country better because they think they're superior to everybody else. Um, not everybody else, but certainly non-Europeans. Uh, the British are going to uh, join with the French uh, and the Russians, <clears throat> who are additionally upset by this uh, German-Austria-Hungarian alliance. In 1907, they formed the Triple Entente, which is just Triple Alliance in France, so far as I know. And that's not Germany. That's going to be Britain, uh, France, and Russia. Uh, so that's going to mean, because they have these alliances set up, obviously this one's been discontinued, but since these two are set up, uh, if any of these major powers ends up in a conflict, they're all brought with the conflict, and that's uh, one of the major contributions to um, um, uh, World War I, was this mad dash for territory, this competition to see who's, who's the best, and that's largely driven by Germany uh, and their rivalry with, um, with France and then Great Britain, too. We'll talk about when we talk about World War I and the causes, but this is a major one, is the alliance systems and this imperialistic competition that they've, that they've got going on. And again, once, once one of these countries begins in a conflict, namely uh, these two, that's going to inevitably bring the rest into conflict. Britain is going to actually hesitate when World War I starts, but that's a World War I topic. So that's going to bring them all together. Um, so that's one way Germany's going to instigate this, um, um, like use imperialism to instigate future conflict in World War I. Uh, but also, they're going to do it in Africa too, uh, in, in a series of events uh, known as the Moroccan Crises. There's actually two, so I'll just put them separately here. Uh, Moroccan Crisis, the first one, was one, and then Moroccan Crisis II. Uh, one's in 1905, and the other's in 1911. Uh, and in both cases, it has to do with uh, uh, Germany opposing French uh, expansion. So Germany really dislikes France, and France really dislikes Germany. So when France begins to uh, use its control of Algeria, uh, in an attempt to uh, control and establish a colony in Morocco in 1905. Germany opposes it. Uh, in fact, the Kaiser of Germany goes to Morocco, who was independent at the time, and, and, and uh, basically says, we support your independence, and kind of implies that they might aid them versus France if France tries to uh, in, in invade and control it. So France is increase, uh, incredibly upset by this. Um, and um, what Germany decides to do <laughs> much to their, uh, 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 wait, was that the second one that they did this? I think the second one's when they had the conference, actually. Maybe it was the first one. Regardless, in one of these, 
Uh, Germany hosts a conference that can vote to decide if France has the right to do this according to their you know, Berlin conference objectives. And everyone except for Austria-Hungary votes in favor of France. So Germany end up, ends up being quite embarrassed by this. Um, I can't remember if it was the first or the second one where that, that particular conference occurred, but it was very apparent during these crises that Germany was the one trying to instigate the conflict and limit France. They actually threatened war in both cases uh, with France, or at least almost do. Uh, in 1911, they even extend that uh, uh, to, to Britain to a degree as well. Um, so both of these instances make Germany look like the aggressors and really convince Britain that... Uh, Germany is the primary concern and, you know, helps them establish this triple entente. And then when World War I uh, sort of begins to surface, it's going to put them, uh, pit them against Germany uh, and their expansionary uh, uh, ambitions. Uh, so the first one, um, Germany was opposing uh, Moroccan control by France, uh, but, the, but, but that ended up settling while it did almost come to a conflict. But the one that was closest to a conflict was the second one. When France did formally take over Morocco, uh, Germany was very much opposed to this. Not just France expanding, but they didn't like how France was adding territory um, without the consultation of, um, of, of Germany and the Europeans. You know, because according to the Berlin Conference, it kind of like divided uh, Africa up, and France was going beyond that. So France uh, opposed Germany's... Um, um, What's the word looking for? Resistance. They didn't resist it actively, though. Objecting to uh, French control of Morocco. Uh, so uh, Germany is going to demand that uh, France grant them some territory in the Congo. And while that's actually going to be what occurs, uh, so France does actually gain control of Morocco uh, peacefully, uh, they do concede some uh, Congo territory to Germany. But again, this one really showcases that Germany is the aggressor here. Like, they send a gunboat uh, uh, near French territory, uh, and uh, they mobilize their reserve troops and position them on the border of France, and so do the French, too. Like, they're ready to go to war already in 1911 over this issue, and the British are appalled by uh, Germany's um, aggression in this. Uh, and again, it really makes them realize that uh, Germany is the one to stop and uh, makes them um, enemies for World War I. So these two are going to be related directly to imperialism. Uh, and this one less so, but it's definitely uh, an, an alliance forming uh, comp competition that's going to lead here to World War I here in 1914. Uh, the very, very, very last topic that we discussed just because it's on the actual AP test uh, is this does actually inspire a, um, a sort of uh, imperialism debate. Not, not even a debate, actually. They don't formally debate, but you have a very supportive of imperialism side. Uh, to the point of, of, of racism, eugenics, and genocide, and you have very much opposed to imperialism side by minority people, um, uh, particularly the Marxists um, un under Lenin. So you have this imperialist uh, debate. It wasn't much of a debate, it's just two very extreme opinions. So don't forget, you have this very social Darwinist attitude, social Darwin attitude, uh, particularly uh, in Germany and France, not as much in Britain, but it, it still did exist. Um, and even if they, they didn't think that they were genetically superior, like s some Germans did, and some Frenchmen did, and even some British, but not, not as much, they definitely had this attitude of what's called a white man's burden, or the white man's burden, which was it was white man's duty to civilize the world and end you know practices like slavery, which I can, we can all agree is a good thing. But it wasn't from a an altruistic, compassionate perspective. It was one of like, oh, you barbarians and your uncivilized practices. So that's why the British did things like ban the sati in, um, um, in India, where like, you know, by choice or not by choice, they would uh, pile on um, living uh, widows to their, to their uh, uh, husband's funeral pyres. Um, and then they also, of course, gonna try to end the slave trade. Um, so you, you could argue those are more humanitarian um, uh, outlooks uh, or perspectives, but they definitely had this attitude of like help the rest of the world out because they're hopelessly behind uh, barbarians. Uh, but the debate itself uh, is going to be characterized by two extremes. The one extreme is uh, very pro-imperialism by a minority, but it's going to be a uh, wealthy and uh, influential minority coming out of Germany, uh, primarily in Prussia, uh, by the Pan-German League. And again, the uh, membership of this league is going to be relatively low in number, like in the hundreds. 
Uh, but, uh, and they, they go from 1891 all the way to the Nazis uh, 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 sort of abolished them in, in 1939 when World War II starts. Uh, the Pan-German League was very much a, a pro-German superiority. Uh, and they believed in, um, uh, in imperialism, that it was, a, it was a just right, and it was a, a chance for Germans to show their superiority and their nationalistic um, um, uh, ability and power. Uh, not just against uh, Africans or Asians or, 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 or non-Europeans, but against other Europeans themselves. Uh, and they encouraged uh, military expansion, uh, even in Europe, um, against the uh, inferior, and I put this in quotes because this is who they saw as, as, as um, um, uh, genetic inferiors. Like these were these were the uh, guys that would be um, influential in, in in shaping the thought of Nazism. Um, uh, the, the 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 Lugers, like the um, um, uh, uh, Vienna mayor uh, with the uh, Austrian Social Democratic Party. Um, they would uh, argue for uh, the taking of territory uh, for colonization by Germans uh, in um, Eastern Europe for the, against the inferior Slavic uh, peoples in Eastern Europe, such like Poland, for example. They did not like the Poles that existed in Prussia. They wanted them out, uh, and they wanted to actually extend German territory into the Slavic regions uh, for, for uh, settling uh, by Germans. Uh, and they were also uh, anti-Semitic. They wanted a removal of the um, Jews in Germany and Europe uh, and anyone else that didn't fall under their, their uh, narrow view of, of, of ethnically pure uh, German uh, or Aryan race uh, later as characterized by the Nazis. So that's pan-Germanism. That's a very pro-impact. That's a bit of an extreme. And again, they were low in number, but they were influential. They were wealthy middle-class uh, Germans, and they had a, a disproportional or disproportionate uh, influence on um, the Reichstag and, and German government. Uh, on the other side, not that this guy was uh, uh, any sort of a white knight, um, you know, he, he ends up um, engaging in plenty of totalitarian and genocidal practice of his own, uh, and classicidal practice uh, when he becomes um, the head of the Soviet Union, and uh, you know, essentially uh, helps uh, pave the way for Stalin, who was even worse. Uh, Vladimir Lenin, who was a Vladimir Lenin. He was an extreme Marxist uh, who was actually exiled from um, Russia due to his anti-Tsarist activities at the University of St. Petersburg, wherever he, wherever he went to university. Um, they, uh, he was a major uh, critic of the Tsar and the Tsarist uh, uh, policies, uh, and there was a very active censorship um, in the late 19th, early 20th century uh, by the Tsar in Russia. So he was exiled. He got really, really loud actually after his uh, brother was executed for partaking in some, uh, some traitorous activity, some plot to overthrow the government or, or alleged plot. I'm not actually sure how seriously he took part in that plot, but nonetheless he was executed and that really radicalized Lenin uh, when his older brother got executed. Um, so uh, he became a, a very anti-Tsarist uh, and anti-imperialist. Um, and the reason why he was anti-imperialist is because he was Marxist. He was very much in favor of Marxist ideas, which were um, opposed to capitalism. And he actually extended, perhaps not entirely improperly, but, but, but certainly partially uh, true criticism, was that imperialism itself was the final stage or extension of capitalism, where you know, these countries formed these monopolistic uh, economies that needed to constantly expand and uh, uh, seek out uh, cheaper resources and labor throughout the world, uh, and did so by conquest. So he saw uh, in his 1917 book, I think it was actually titled something like this, was uh, uh, Capitalism, or sorry, Imperialism uh, as the uh, final stage, as final or late stage of capitalism. And again, he saw this, um, it, was, it was a bit narrow and oversimplistic as many radical ideologies are, whether they're fascist or Marxist or anarchist or whatever they are. Um, they take a very overly simplistic look at the world, but he was certainly was partially right that uh, their uh, desire to enhance the wealth of their own nation and maybe even companies in those nations uh, did uh, end up fostering, financing, and driving a lot of this imperialism 
Uh, so that wasn't the sole reason, but that was certainly a contributing factor. Uh, and that was uh, Vladimir Lenin providing the most uh, widespread. I think he actually wrote the book in 1917. Um, he was the one that explicitly uh, advocated for non-imperialism against it, you could say. Most Europeans, though, at the time were not particularly concerned with it. The average European didn't care that much. Um, there were a lot of Enlightenment views, of course, that, that guided these more humanitarian goals and objectives and practices, but most people weren't really aware or, or, or of or cared about um, uh, the imperialistic practices uh, outside of their home societies. Uh, the governments were torn a bit uh, as far as what they should do uh, based on the uh, people that were in power. So like if you had a more conservative uh, set of elections in Great Britain, you might have uh, a bit more imperialistic uh, actions whereas if a bit more liberal uh, set of people were uh, voted in, as a typical liberal democracies, you'd have a lot more enlightenment values being espoused. Um, but Germany was pretty much wholly nationalistic because they were the center of the counter-enlightenment uh, and they were um, a much larger driving force. Uh, and they had a lot more of the uh, outright racist radicals. There were still plenty of examples of that in France, um, like we talked about with the Dreyfus affair and, and, and whatnot. And of course, you have Austria and Hungary are also uh, have a fair amount of anti-Semitism, but um, Germany probably appropriately gets the uh, uh, unfortunate award for at the time being the uh, the biggest driver of the uh, very negative side of nationalism, which is hyper-nationalistic to the point of uh, of outright racism in in, in their case, uh, and driving this uh, counter-enlightenment romanticism, this German idealism to the point that they opposed all the races and wanted to eliminate them. And the Pan-German League was, a, was an excellent pre-Nazi, uh, uh, proto-Nazi uh, group that was uh, intensely anti-Semitic uh, racist uh, organization that was bent on uh, expansion at the expense of other races, uh, with Vladimir Lenin being the equally radical, but on the left, uh, against imperialism because he opposed capitalism. So that is the highly detailed probably too long uh, explanation of imperialism, but uh, I feel it's important that you guys understand this because imperialism is a huge topic on the AP test for both AP World and AP Euro. Uh, and uh, I want you to at least have an idea of how it happened. He's just saying, oh, there was a scramble for Africa and then they conquered uh, parts of China and India. That doesn't really do it justice. So this kind of gives you an idea of what motivated it and how that there's, there's actually two conflicting motivations. You have enlightenment ideals that are uh, opposed to uh, general imperialist practice, certainly the more brutal versions of it, but you also have this counter-enlightenment, hyper-nationalist, competitive imperial drive that's gonna uh, contribute to the start of World War I and is going to result in um, uh, imperial expansion in Africa uh, and Asia. So that is imperialism. Uh, Britain gets the head start on this new wave, but it's gonna be in full force by the 1880s. Uh, and by World War I, Europe uh, and the United States pretty much directly or indirectly control almost all of the uh, all of the globe so that's imperialism <laughs>